Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learning, be learning about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe on the Crossboard Interviews, the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who actually live there. Shocker! So please help me welcome to the show for today's episode, Mayor Sarah's story of the village of Fraser River Lake in the province of British Columbia. I kept on saying Fraser River, Fraser River, and I still got it wrong. Uh, <laughs> Fraser Lake in the province of British Columbia. Uh, Mayor, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. So, Sarah, I'm going to start off with the question I've asked every other uh, mayor and councillor who's ever come on. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, that's a that's a long story, actually, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it short. So a lot of years ago, I worked for a municipality and I was living in a different one. And I think that kind of got me where I am today. But before that, I think my parents had a, a really big you know, role in my life on volunteerism and giving back to communities, whether it was through different conservation efforts through Super City Wildlife or helping people um, <clears throat> and bridge connections through the disabled community in the Prince George area. My mom used to travel all over. My mom is this amazing human and she just did so much for the city of Prince George growing up and people with disabilities. And uh, and I don't know, she just was this, 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 uh, person who just went and she could do anything she could build a you know build a wall or build a house or paint a room and and then decide well I want a painting so she'd make the painting so she just yeah she really inspired me to be who I am and then I went from there to working for municipality and living in another one and realizing this municipality that I'm living in really is struggling and it really needs help and I think you have a role as a leader um, or as a human, let's just say you're just an everyday person, like we all are, and you go, yeah, there's problems here. There's things that need to be fixed. So what do you do? Do you go and fix them or do you complain about them? I had an option. I decided to go and try to fix things and help out. So that's kind of where I came from in my past, just growing up and seeing so many wonderful leaders as well, um, surrounded by my mother, just happened to be this, this strong woman. And uh, I got to see things being done. And I, uh, I I took that from her, I think. So the premise of this show is to get to know the people who are making up these elected councils across this great country. And I always want to know, and I want to know from you, why municipal? You could have chosen provincial, you could have chosen school board, you could have chosen federal, but you at the end of the day said, I believe my best service, my best duty to serve would be better served at the municipal level. So what was it about municipal politics and municipal government that drew you to it? I think it's it's a lot of things. When you have um, small children, as I did, and you could see the issues that were happening like smaller communities you can feel it differently I think than larger communities and I was born in North Vancouver grew up in Squamish for first couple of years and then grew up in Prince George and then moved to Fraser Lake which is west of Prince George by about an hour and a half so I moved here and realized you know if I have kids that have to live in this community I need to help make it better and obviously with municipal politics and municipal government, it, it is done a little bit differently. You are on the ground, you are talking to the people. And I was running a senior center and I was working for the college. And I actually had about 16 jobs at the time. I think I was working for work BC and running all these events and activities. And I was just a little bit crazy as a, I guess I would have been about 34 at the time. A um, little bit crazy. I love doing things and helping things. So I thought, well, you know, there's no better time than trying to make sure that your children have a future in this community so you can stay in this community than right now and working in that municipal, you know, sort of setting. I have been approached to run provincially and, and I've thought about it. And, you know, when I talk to the provincial, you know, leaders out there and I talk to municipal leaders, you know, it really boils down to you can touch and feel things a little bit easier in your, in your community as a whole. And I, I find that 
that part is more engaging. You you really get to get to the nuts and bolts of things. It's not maybe not as hard. Maybe it's harder in other ways. I don't know, but it it is all encompassing also. So it is a tougher role, but it yeah, I, I don't know the exact answer, but I do know that it just felt right at the time to go uh, municipal and help out my community to to make it help it get through the hard times that it was going through. So I, I try to do as little research as possible for these shows because I want to learn from the people like you instead of me assuming things and reading things that other people have written or wrote. But the one thing I do look at is when you first uh, ran. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you first put your name forward in 2014 for mayor of your village uh, un- unsuccessfully at that election because you were then elected in 2018. But what in particular in 2014 decided, OK, this is Sarah's time. You know what? I have all these things going on. Was there a local issue in your community that was uh, prevalent or was it just people asking you? Yeah, there was a there was a situation that happened when I worked for the College of New Caledonia and um, my students at the time said, and I won't get into the whole story, but they basically they're adult students and they said to me, you should just run for mayor. And I was like, you know, I could do that before I never thought of that. I wasn't like, yes, I'm going to be in politics one day. And no, no idea I wanted to be in politics. Like, I really didn't, actually, now that I think about it. I, <laughs> I work for a municipality and I remember them going, yeah, we're going to train you to be the next CAO. They weren't like, hey, do you want to run for mayor in the district of Vanderhoof? No, that wasn't happening. So I thought, yeah, I'll be in here in a different way. But then when my students said, <clears throat> why don't you just run for mayor? You obviously know what the heck you're doing. And I thought, yeah, I should do that. And I never, and then I thought about it more. And normally they say it takes two or three times to ask somebody to run for mayor, but it was like, you know, 20 adult students that are going, you should really do this. And because it was doing so much in the community at the time, yeah, sure. That made some sense, but then some things started happening and I thought, yeah, you know, you should do this only to build a platform. I didn't do it to win. I wasn't even on council at that time. So I did it to build a platform and say, this is what I'm going to do if I get in as mayor, only because I thought then the other council would have to build a platform as well and then go against that and say, this is what we're going to do too. And that's really what I wanted to see. So then from there, I did get in in a by-election. Uh, I ran against, I think there was seven men that ran um, in 2015. So I did get in in 2015 as a councillor and uh, one with majority of the vote. And then I was on council for one term. And then now this is my second term as mayor. So third, this is my third term in total. But yeah, there was there was some things for sure that go on in small communities. And, and you definitely hear those and go, okay, how are we going to fix this? Let's get in there and get to work. You you bring up a good point, particularly during municipal elections. You hear about the day to day going on of your neighbors. While you may think you have a pulse on your community, there are micro issues that people will raise with you when you approach them at the door. In that first election in 2014, in the subsequent by-election in 2015, was there micro issues that while you might have had a pulse on the community, you went? I'm surprised someone's talking about this, but I'm glad they are. So that way, when elected, or if I am elected, I can address them. Um, I don't think I can look back and say there were micro issues. There were big issues. There was no asset management policies or plans in place. There was a major infrastructure deficits, and there was not a lot of work done in the past from the previous councils to really address that. So it wasn't micro issues. There was nothing really, because I don't, you, you obviously don't know me and the people listening to this don't know me very well, but I'm kind of like, you know, a dog with a bone some days. Like I, I, I really go and go, wow, there's a lot of things we could do. And I look at the whole picture. Like I did like a two page, what I'm going to do platform that was beautiful. My background was business and marketing. So I've made this thing look amazing. It was great. And I was like, we're doing everything, you know, like, but but the things that really made sense to people like the aging infrastructure was such a huge piece and component to what the community needed and how that was going to be addressed. And also people didn't know where the village of Fraser Lake was. They didn't know us, we were struggling financially. We were, we had issues, you know, we lost the mine shortly after I got on council and you know, the sawmill and forestry was becoming a, a you know, a, it still is, it's a, it's a major, um, 
issue that we're facing. And so there was just a lot of things that were happening during that time. And I wish I could say it was just, you know, something small, but there were many, many things that were, you know, really needing to be addressed for the community. We're going to talk about some issues that are affecting the village today, later on in the interview, but I want to go back to that first election in 2014. We always remember the first time you see your name on the ballot and you get to put your little X beside your name. It's a surreal experience that not a lot of people had had the ability to uh, uh, do. For you, what was that experience like to, after the chips are all on the table, after all the door knocking, all the conversations, you walk into that ballot box and at the end of the day, everyone else is and they, they're putting an X beside someone's name. For you, what was that experience like to see your name on the ballot? And do you still get that same feeling in this subsequent past election? I know you were acclaimed, but in 2018. Yeah, I mean, that was a stressful time and stressful moment because <laughs> I, I thought, whoa, well, you know, you're... What if you do win? Like, I, I wasn't necessarily trying to win the first time. I wasn't, you know, I had a lot of people saying, oh, you know, you, you know you're too young or, you know, you, you're not, you don't have a mustache. You're not, you know, one of those guys that needs to, you, or you make too many waves. We don't want people that make waves. And I, and yeah, I remember it being very exciting. And when I found out I only lost by 49, I thought, holy, that says a lot. It is typically harder to um, knock out a seated mayor is what I was always told. So I thought that that said something. So yeah, and then 2018 came around and, and then I ran and, uh, and, and that was tough too. And I, I beat the, the previous mayor by 49 and, you know, th that's a hard thing to do. Also, you, you don't want to hurt any, and it's a small town. So you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings when you do these things either. You get a big heart and you kind of go, Oh yeah, well, I'm not doing this for my ego. I'm doing this for the community. I'm doing this for my children. I'm doing it for the rest of the community. So it, you, all of those things, exciting, stressful for sure. Cause you're putting yourself out there and putting yourself out there is never easy. Right. I think that's the in 2018, you do get elected. There's a weight now put on your there's a weight that you put on your shoulders whenever you're elected into a, a municipal government, because the decisions you make are most the most impactful level of government uh, decisions that are impacting residents, but also the decisions are affecting the day to day lives of your community members. For you, how much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure when you go into that council chambers, you're informed, but you're ready to make the tough decisions when it comes to issues that are facing your community? I probably put more weight on myself than, than you know, most people think or know. And I think that's, that's the same for many people that you know become mayors uh, in particular. I think being a councillor is... is uh, is a little bit different. It is still really busy. If you make it that way, you can put as much into this job or as little into this job as you want to. If you put little into it, you get little out of it. You know, if you're not advocating for your community or making the connections and networking and doing the, the work and the research behind the scenes, there's so much to do. I could do this job 24 seven. I need feel like I do. It is a, you know, uh, it, it is one of those jobs you get out of it what you put into it and we definitely have seen that here um i, I don't think I, they i hear this a lot We've never really had a working mayor in fraser lake where you know you're just constantly going the adv advocacy that you do behind the scenes is is really important and i think it's really helped fraser lake a lot so you know you put a lot on yourself to try to make sure you're making the best decisions every day and i think that's really important to do you're not going out there going how can i mess up this community today that's not what anybody ever does let's but hope not they're i doing sure that. hope not <laughs> anyway um although i have heard some things over the years and different areas <laughs> but you know that's not <laughs> not for me to judge um no judgment here but i do think that you are there to put your community first you are there to make sure you're making the best decisions and learning uh, I think that's really important. A lot of people don't put onus on going to, to like training and conferences. They're like, oh, no, you don't need that. You're wasting taxpayers' dollars. No, no. I want people, like I say that to my counselors, I want you to go and get training. Because if you get training and you learn about asset management, you're learning about different policies or bylaws, you're not going to get your municipality in trouble. You are going to help support whatever is going on out there. You're you're learning the new issues, whether it's housing issues and how to, how to address them or how to address homelessness or whatever it might be. Because I think in our role, we're pivoting constantly. 
it is this huge job and it never used to be as busy. I don't think like I look back into this isn't your granddad's granddad's council. You know, this isn't, you know, well, yeah, we fix a pothole every now and then and we pass the taxes. It's changed a lot where we're dealing with, you know, decriminalization of drugs in BC. We're dealing with opioid crises. We're dealing with homelessness and home and, and, and housing and all of these different situations. And I find it very interesting to see how much local government has to has to do now and we talk about downloading and we talk about all of these things that municipalities never had to deal with before as and I would say maybe they dealt with them in a certain way but not to the extent they're dealing with now especially with the infrastructure deficits and the lack of money to fix the the concerns and issues that we're all facing right now. How much of your job is advocacy to the different levels of government? Because I can imagine you're on the phone with your MLA, you're the ministers, the province on a regular basis, because you want the best for your community. How much of the job is advocacy compared to the sitting in council meetings? Because I think a lot of people find that disconnect where they think, oh, you're just a, you, you go to one meeting a month, so that's all you do. But there's a lot more behind the scenes work. I would say... I would say like 80% of the job is advocacy and meetings and just being out there and learning and talking to people and, and yeah, it's huge. Like, so I was the first uh, uh, person in Fraser Lake um, to be on the North Central Local Government Board. Um, this is my sixth year being on that board and um, that covers 70% of the land mass of BC almost and uh, that's it, it's a huge geographical region and I ended up becoming the president of the North Central Local Government Area Association and before before I was on council we hadn't even had a resolution so a resolution for people that are listening that don't know they they, they help support uh, an issue so it'll say therefore be it resolved that the village of Fraser Lake work on the water hazard buoys I call them buoys not boys for those of you out there that like to call them boys but um you know that was one of the resolutions we built because we have water that's going down and we have all these hazards you know on different lakes in the region we don't want anybody to get hurt and it's just something so you take those resolutions they go from the north central local government to uh, so that your area association so there's different area associations in bc and then they go from that to ubcm which is union of british Columbia municipalities the resolutions are brought to the floor there if they've passed at your area association and from there you do more advocacy after that and so i did get on the ubcm board as well as the president of nclj and then i ran and got on and then i'm on again this year um that's a longer story but so this will be my third year on ubcm as well so when we take those you know conversations and we're putting fraser lake on the map for instance you know people know where fraser lake is i'm constantly talking to provincial leaders or mlas mps you're constantly out there doing those those things on top of all the different boards you're on the mayor isn't always on every single board but in my area the mayor is on pretty much every single board from ndit to the regional district there's just so many boards and so many things that you're doing and you can, like I said, do as little as possible or as much as possible. By being on those boards and advocating, you make a huge difference, not just to your community, but to your region and to your province. So, and that benefits everybody. So I don't do these things just to, you know, benefit one little tiny thing. I do these things so that when you do need some help with something, you have those connections as well, because it is who you know. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. It is. <laughs> now, I'm not going to burst your bubble, but I'm, I'm imagining this is not your end goal in life is just to be mayor of the village. You are not going to be there for the remainder of your life. I, I I'm not I'm not hopefully not putting much in your uh, mouth here, but uh, you might have a few more terms. But are you setting a precedent for the next mayor? Are you setting the precedent that, you know what, this is what small town mayors should be? Because I will be honest, when I was doing my little research on you, I was like, how busy is this woman? Like she is constantly going. You are like everywhere and you are like so advocacy. You are, you are such an advocate for your village. I'm thinking you are setting a standard that all village mayors across this country should strive to be because you hear about Fraser, Fraser Lake so often now. And it might just because I was preparing for this interview that I'm like, 
you have put it on the map and it is a village, not a town, not a city, but a village. Like, are you setting a standard here? I hope so, because I've been hoping that <laughs> I, I've been, I keep hoping that there's a succession plan. I really do believe that it is important for me to set the bar and then to say, hey, who can step up to this and take this over for when I do go? What if I get hit by a bus tomorrow? I tell them that all the time. I'm sure they love hearing that. But <laughs> it's like, hey, you don't know. I need somebody to take over. And I need you to all have these connections and get on these boards and do this work too, because it is so vitally important for your community. And I, I don't know if people, you know, take that seriously or not, but succession planning is a huge thing for me. And I really do think that all municipalities have to be looking at that. It's not just something that I have to look at. And yeah, it, it's, it's obviously always going to be different when somebody steps into your shoes when you leave you know, everybody's going to do something a different way. But my hope and my, my prayers, you know, would be that somebody would do the job better than me after I left, not worse. So to set them up for success is super important. And I, I think we need to really focus on that as leaders, not, and bringing people together, not, not pushing people apart. You, you, I, there's a saying, you know, surround yourself with people smarter than you. And I think, that's actually a really good thing for a leader to do. Don't be upset if somebody has a better idea than you. In fact, you should be happy that they have good vision. So that's what I really want to push on. You know, my council and other councils is, is you know, help and support those people. It doesn't matter if they're men or they're women or whatever. They, you know, it doesn't matter. It support your council and they'll support you. There's ways to bring your council together and make them stronger. And I think that's part of it. Now I'm cautious of time here and I want to turn to segment two of this, of this interview. And this, in this segment is about the village as a whole. And before I uh, enter into the first question, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not an opinion of, uh, this is not a, mo a policy of council, not a resolution of council. This is her opinion. I seem to always get emails about this question. Mayor. In your opinion, what is the biggest issue as of recording this that is facing the village of Fraser Lake today? Well, I really or think, issues. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I do think it's more than one, but infra aging infrastructure is a huge, and I mentioned that earlier, it's it's probably the biggest issue that most municipalities are are facing whether you're facing all the other issues on top of it it just compounds but you know if aging infrastructure and and the and, and the second one which is probably going to you know go into that aging infrastructure piece long term is how to become a sustainable community without you know, industry. So the thing for us is we lost in Daco mine. Will it ever open? We don't know. And all those rumors, you know, small towns and how that works. And then you have West Racer sawmills, which is struggling and down to one shift and we don't know what's happening. So for me, the biggest issue is how to be prepared and how to be sustainable long-term without industry. So they come in, they take, you know, the resources and then they're gone. And what are you left with? You always want to leave a legacy behind, making sure you're putting money away into reserves for the bad times, not just, you know, enjoying the good times. You have to make sure that you set up the future councils for success. And so for me, tourism, looking at tourism right now, looking at ways to diversify are huge. They're very important. So, you know, I personally have been going, hey, we need to build a marina and we need to build a roundhouse restaurant down here. And then we finish this arena project and then I can get an investor to build a hotel. We need a new hotel. There's no way around that. We need to be able to put provincials and all these different things on. And there's communities that are around our size that have 11 hotels. We have two and they're definitely aging hotels. And we need, we need to look at the big picture as a, as a council and go, okay, how are we going to save this community if there is no industry here at all? And, and that taxation component is so big people don't realize like if you lose all your industry and you have no taxation where does that where does that fall who pays to keep the lights on well it's just the residents and you can't necessarily afford to do that and you can't you don't want to be raising the taxes 30 percent for every single taxpayer in the in the municipality so you've got to come up with plan b and that's why the advocacy and the work behind the scenes is so important 
We're going to be talking about tourism a little bit later, but I want to stick on these issues because aging infrastructure is a common theme. I'm hearing a lot from smaller communities, but also from communities all across Canada. So Fraser Lake is not anywhere unique in this issue. No. Um, you're right. You can't raise taxes on the backs of the people who live there, because if you did to the point where you needed to replace all this aging infrastructure, you would cripple your community. You talk about asset management a lot in the first opening segment. How how important was it for you to implement an asset management uh method that ensured that what you were fixing was the most needed to be fixed instead of just what you thought should be fixed. It was, it was eye opening. I went and did this course. I can't remember what year it was. I want to say it was 2015. I did. I went to this course uh, at one of the local government leadership academy conferences and I walked out of there going, wow, why was everybody here? You all needed to be here. So I, I remember going back to council and saying, hey, we need to really work on this. And so we were actually ahead of the game because our staff did such an amazing job and uh, went out and we, we, we did this mapping exercise and we had Excel spreadsheets from one end of the you know, table to the other, of, you know, what needs to be replaced when? and how much it's gonna to cost to replace it. And, and if it isn't 10 years from now, well, will the price be, you know, with inflation and everything that's going on, how much more will it be? So then putting some extra on that. So it was really, really a great exercise. And, and now it wouldn't be an exercise at all. Now it is like implemented, it is in place. And it's something that we look at constantly. And we use that, you know, especially for the grants that we have applied for. So we've applied for a $6 million grant to replace the water tower. So the water tower and the roads that are on either side, which is actually what happens to be one of them is my streets, which is um, really needs to be replaced. We, we have, um, you know, concrete asbestos water lines. All these things have to be replaced in the whole town. But we're, Did you we're say you have be- concrete asbestos water yeah. lines? Yeah, so these are old water lines that need, you can't actually clean them out. So it's a bit of a, you know, problem. So obviously, <laughs> no. yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a huge priority for me to get those done. And I remember, you know, back in the day, so how are you fixing those? Oh, we'll fix things as they break. No, that's not how you need to run a municipality. You need to make sure you have a plan in place and you're going, okay, what are we replacing this year? What are we replacing next year? What are we replacing in 10 years or five years? So, you know, the fire truck is coming up. But it, it, maybe that's not, you know, that's not a road, but if you know the fire hall is going to need to be replaced or the fire truck is going to need to be replaced, you need to know when that's going to happen and make sure you're prepared for that expense and putting money away to one of the big things was actually water and sewer. We hate raising the utility rates, hate it. Like I absolutely hate it. I hate paying it myself, but it's. Because <laughs> usually that's the first thing that you will hear from residents when you raise it even a dollar, yes. they will, you will hear about it. And that's the thing, you have to actually legally cover your costs for water, sewer, and garbage. So if you're losing money on water, sewer, and garbage, you're legally not allowed to do that, one. But two, you don't want to do that because you actually want to be making sure you're putting money away every year to replace that infrastructure as it breaks or needs to be replaced. So that's a huge thing for me. You talk about the economic uh, drivers in your community, the West Fraser sawmill. You talked about the mines earlier on. Um what does council, what role do you see council playing in attracting new businesses to your village, but at the same time, ensuring that you are getting the leg up compared to the surrounding communities? Because when a business comes to any community, they'll look at the surrounding areas and say, well, it's more financially feasible for us to be in X community instead of your community. So how are you looking at the diversification of your economy, but also attracting new economic drivers? Yeah, I think there's, well, there's a whole bunch to that. I think one, you need to make sure you have the services in place. So in this do you, do you believe that the village does? Um, no, no, actually oh. don't. I think that there's a few things missing, like subsidized childcare. So when you're trying to attract teachers, doctors, RCMP officers in particular, that is a big thing. You need to make sure you have things in place, like really good childcare. So do I think we still have a ways to go with a few things? Yes, we definitely do. Because you need to make sure you have all those systems in place so you can attract the right residents and the professionals you want in your community as well. So there's... 
there's that part and then there's more that goes with that but it's it's really important to to look long term at tourism and you know you you mentioned the the communities making sure your community is kind of put first it actually matters to me that the communities that surround us, and we work on this together, so Vanderhoof, Fort St. James, Burns Lake, we talk about this actually together as a whole because what happens in one community impacts the next. We are very connected. So we don't think sometimes just about ourselves, which I think is kind of a cool thing to do. It's important that we are supporting our neighbors and our neighbors are supporting us. So we're cheering each other on through the hard times. So something that we've been working on actually in this region is the Resource Benefit Alliance, which they, the acronym is RBA. So the RBA agreement is a revenue sharing agreement that we're trying to get for the north and northern communities from Vanderhoof up to Prince Rupert, Kinmat area and, and back. So that would help us long term dealing with these aging infrastructure and all the issues that we're dealing with, um, because a lot of the revenue comes from the north and doesn't stay here. So then we're left with holding the bag of, you know, whether it's housing or whatever it might be and, and just don't have, you know, the money to be able to fix the issues that we have. But yeah, so that's part of it. But we definitely try to make sure that we support each other and we we find that sometimes difficult. I know right now there's a real big shortage on economic development officers or CAOs. In, and I think I would say all of Canada. I don't think it's just BC. So it seems like there's this, you know, everybody's trying to steal each other's employees. Um, and it's like, that we all want the best CAO, but then you got to pay more money for that. But um, yeah, there's a there's little bit, so there's little things like that, you know, happening. But you, you mentioned something that I wasn't going to bring up, but I just had an interview with a fellow colleague of yours from the town of Princeton, so southern uh, BC, who talked about the provincial municipal relationship. And I'm not going to pair. I'm not going to try and quote him because I probably butcher what he said. But he talked about the need for the province to understand that the issues in smaller communities matter as well, because he felt that. This larger urban centers are getting the majority of the 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 funding, the issues that resolved, and they're forgetting about the villages and the towns. Do you feel like that in your community? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. I'm just trying to ask because I'm trying to see if this is a reoccurring theme or it's just a one off theme. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm going to be very, very honest here, which is how I always like to be. I totally think this is an issue. I I say to, you know provincial leaders all the time you know if we relieve the pr pressure in the south so the Vancouver area for instance Okanagan the housing is so expensive it's so expensive to live in some of these communities and there's no housing left if you would support us to get the services we need in place and to expand on housing or whatever it might be it's cheaper to live here on many many <laughs> in many ways so why don't you help support us and then we will relieve the pressure in the south there was you know uh, a recent announcement of one billion dollars that was given out to the municipalities to help with the infrastructure and whatever needs and i did write a letter and i did say like hey why don't you divide it equally between the 180 i think it was 181 different municipalities and regional districts and give us all five million dollars each and see where we can go because the smaller communities don't have the ability to tax more. I had some interesting conversations with, you know, people in different places, the city of Vancouver. I have a friend that's on the UBCM board and I said to him, okay, hey, question Pete Fry, Councillor Pete Fry, if you raise your taxes one, one percent, how much money do you get? He goes, well, we'll get about 9.2 million. And then I said, well, how much are you guys thinking about raising your taxes this year? And he goes, oh, well, I, I, I think we've all in discussions and I don't know if I'm supposed to say this out loud, but sorry, Pete. Um, he goes, well, we're probably gonna go about 10%. And I said, that's $92 million. If the village of Fraser Lake raises their taxes 1%, guess what we get, 30,000. said, so we have the same infrastructure deficits as other municipalities and we have to replace a water tower. It costs the same amount as when somebody else has to replace a water tower. And so, when you think of that, but we don't have that ability to tax and get that money. We have to do everything through grants. And then when you have a limited amount of staff, you know, these smaller municipalities don't have the same resources. We don't have the same staff on in place. I, you know, I have two real main staff members that do a majority of the work. We get more grants than a lot of communities because we work so freaking hard. But, you know, like at the same time, you know, when you 
you have engineers on staff or you have all these things, it's a lot different. I mean, even as a small town mayor, I have to do everything. I don't have people that answer my emails for me or whatever else. And it's like, it's true. Uh, the mayor and I were <laughs> conversing back and forth on a regular occurrence. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, when you have staff that do things for you and can relieve the pr pressure, that's great too. But, you know, we, the, as I say, the small town mayors work probably a lot harder in some aspects, but the big town mayors have to be in more, more, probably more meetings or have to go to more Zoom. I don't know. I feel like I do the same as they too, but yeah, I have no, no real staff support. It's a different way, but anyway. But do you feel heard? <laughs> Do you feel heard by the, like, with all your advocacy work that you've done yes. over the time that you've been mayor and council, are you feeling like they're finally listening or, or and I'm putting you on the spot here. I'm just, I want to know, like, does, because I asked the mayor of Princeton this as well. So you're not no exception, but do you feel heard after all the advocacy work that you do that you're actually getting through and something is changing? I think that they've learned a lot because we we really hammer down, like make sure you engage with local government. Don't just implement, you know, this blanket policy for all of BC or whatever it might be, because we're all different. And I, I think that, you know, we should look at that with MPs as well and all of the federal government. It's like when something comes down from, you know, Ontario and they're like, yeah, we're going to do this big thing. Well, you know, each province has its different, unique needs and wants and issues and concerns. So, you know, when you talk about gun control, for instance, it looks different in BC than it might in Ontario or Quebec. We, we have all of these different nuances and, and I and I feel them. So it's just always making sure that you are speaking to the province and letting them know that, you know, these are our issues. Are you going to listen to us? And I feel like they definitely are trying to engage more. There's a lot of MLAs and MPs and, and ministers out there that really do get it and they come from our regions and they really do try to fight for things too. I mean, we don't always get what we want, but I think there's a song about that. So uh, <laughs> we, we know it's true, right? <laughs> we can't always get what we want because everybody has needs. So it's hard. So on the flip side of that, let's go back to the village for a second on that same sentiment. You only have a certain amount of money every year. You can't run a deficit. I'm not sure if in BC you can run deficits, but in Alberta no. you can't. So in BC you can't run a deficit. So you, at the end of the day, have to look at the people in your community and their issues are important to them, whether it be a new park in that uh, their area or a sidewalk update or a pothole in front of their house. Their issue is important to them. How do you as mayor and council look at the big picture of the village and then dissect it by going, we need to grow the community. We need to look at economic development. We need to look at tourism. We need to look at aging infrastructure, but we also have to look at John's issue of his pothole in front of his house. And we have to make sure everyone feels that their money is being spent wisely. How do you as mayor and council Look at the individual issues when it comes to your village. You know, we're not supposed to get into the nitty gritty of whose pothole needs to be filled first. Technically, you're supposed to leave that to your staff and not cross those lines. But Understandable, but they will come talk to you. They won't go oh, talk to John exactly. the Greater. They're going to talk to yeah. Sarah the Mayor. <laughs> exactly. And I think, they're, they're, well, there's a couple of things here, but, you know, we... As a municipality, you know, this year we have the community forest money that won't last for long. So it's like we can do much more right now than we've ever been able to do before. What is that going to look like in 10, 20 years from now? We don't know. What is it going to look like in three years? Don't know. So each day, you know, you you might get a complaint about something. But I, remember my favorite word? I don't know. I said it earlier. I don't know if I told you it was my favorite word, but pivoting, I think, has my, been my favorite word since COVID started because that's what we've been doing. And I think that's what you do is, as a municipality. You, you, you're putting out fires too, but you're really supposed to work off your strategic plan. You're supposed to say, okay, what is your strategic plan? It's tourism, it's economic development, it's asset management, whatever it might be. And then you're supposed to work off of that to make sure you're, you know, using the tools that you have in place whether it's asset management you know plans and policies and making sure you're 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 hitting those things that need to be done i think as a good council i think we have a really good council that we looked at everything as a whole this year during budget and said okay these are the main priorities let's get these done and then when you need to pivot because there's an emergency or a grant that comes available if you have the capacity to do that then you do it and and that's what we do i think as a whole and i think small communities are good at that in some ways, we we know how to address the issues 
um, sometimes quickly and uh, and sometimes we're better at that because we don't have as many roads, let's say, but you know, you're still gonna have the complaint you didn't get my windrow removed fast enough when the big huge snowstorm happened yesterday. And it's like, yes, we know we're trying, we can only go so fast, but you, you get there. And pivoting is, is all of, is is all the rage apparently. That's <laughs> what so we get to. I have one last question in this segment before we turn to our last one about tourism, and it's about apathy. Um, I have noticed over the last few years that municipal governments, municipal elections, voter turnout is going down lower and lower every year. Now, I know you were acclaimed. I'm not sure what the voter turnout for the council election was, but across BC in the last election, it was down. Are you seeing voter apathy and uh, engagement apathy within the village? 100%. And and I think looking back on what everything's happening, and I think social media is, you know, part of this as well. Everybody's so inundated with she did this, he did that. It's pretty good in Fraser Lake, I have to say. They like me here, apparently, I think, <laughs> from what I've heard. But uh, who knows? <laughs> but I think people are just kind of, I mostly believe in humor, by the way. So people, I think, just kind of have got to that point where they're tired of hearing about it. Do, do they trust that things are going to change or get better? I don't know, but I think part of that is we forget in Canada, in particular, I'm going to use Canada as a whole, not just going to say BC, how lucky we are for the things that we do have. And I think that is where we've got to this point where we're so content and we have so much that we sometimes complain um, because we have nothing else to talk about. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. That's just my my opinion. Again, I just, I'm finding that people are are, are are becoming more negative because they're almost bored and technology and the way things have, have changed our landscape, uh, uh, the way we talk about politics, the way we talk about people, all of these things, people are afraid to even say things now. I mean, you'll have mayors that don't post a whole lot, um, municipalities don't do a whole lot because they don't want engagement anymore because they're because it doesn't matter what you say, you're gonna have 50 people that are against it and 50 people that are for it. And I think that's become part of the problem. People are afraid to really have those real conversations that do need to be had. And I don't know, I, I don't know how to fix it, but I think when there's like a really big important issue, you'll see a bigger voter turnout, obviously. And, and yeah. we're seeing that around the, the North as well understandable so i want to turn to segment three and this is my favorite segment not saying that the last 40 minutes of conversation <laughs> hasn't been fun but i like tourism i like visiting communities and i've said if you come on my show i'm going to be in your community so when i drive up to go visit uh, uh council uh, <laughs> in prince george i'm going to be stopping in fraser lake to visit you and visit some of the tours of destinations that you're about to t- tell me so <laughs> mayor what are some of the hidden gems and tourist destinations in your community well, that's the cool thing about Fraser Lake. It is a big area. So you have a lot of places you can go and like obviously hiking, fishing, canoeing, kayaking, going fishing at the Slaco River, which is a one of the world renowned fly fishing rivers and going to Chislata Falls and checking out the, the falls. It's a beautiful hike. There's just so many areas and places to go around here to, to visit and see there's different, there's a few different resorts that you can get cabins at or whatever, but everything seems to be pretty booked lately. It's getting busier and busier. I like the pier in Fraser Lake and the, the mouse mountain. So we have a mountain that looks like a mouse and at the end of it is a point. So we call it cheese point because it is kind of in a triangle so it actually all works out so uh in 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 the municipality itself i mean it's not a big municipality but it has uh this beautiful lake that we're that we're on and so we get to oversee and overlook um just amazing sunsets and views and the northern lights lately have just been phenomenal so uh, i think bird watching is a big thing around this area too they call us the white swan capital of the world i don't know if that's legit yet um but we uh we we definitely get a lot of uh, swans in the in the winter and before the rivers and the lakes you know kind of freeze up and 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 it's it's just it's just a beautiful place. I love going to Francois Lake where my parents live. It's about 15 minutes from here as well and hanging out. And we just, it, it's called the Lakes District for a reason. There's so many lakes and so many beautiful things to see. And 
and uh, good people. But yeah, there's there's some some things to do around here, and you can rent snowshoes and uh, skis and go on the lake. There's lots of people. There's a lot of volunteers that cut trails, and in the winter we build a big arena on the ice, and everybody goes out and skates. It's absolutely beautiful. So we have a, we have a few things to get to do, but I'm hoping we can get some more, and uh, that way we can, you know, help the community grow in a positive way. So after a long day of council, after a long day of advocating for your community, where do you go to decompress? Is there a local watering hole? Is there a, a path that you take and just reconnect with yourself and just let the stress of the day go away? Yeah, I can't say I do that. I'm not, a, I'm not <laughs> much of a drinker, so I... <laughs> not a big partier you know it's really boring I'm like the most boring mayor in the north they still like me though I don't know why but they uh <laughs> mine is reading you know in my bath or whatever it might be it's just uh I, I typically work to about three o'clock in the morning I have this weird kind of crazy schedule where I get up at seven and I go and I go and I go and I don't really know how to stop one day I'll learn um but uh yeah so I don't really know how to I can't say I know how to decompress well <laughs> I would say that would be a fault that I'm working on. I'm trying to have this work-life balance and be better at that. Uh, yeah, it, that that is tough, but I do have some good friends and we hang out, but I am a hockey mom. So I have two kids. So I am. So you're at, usually at the arena. <laughs> Or putting on, like, I'm part of the, I've been running the, I'm president of the slow pitch. So I go play slow pitch in the summer and I've been running that for, I don't even know, 11 years or something crazy. And I uh, teach youth ball also. Uh, last year I started that and this year I'm going to do it again because. Um, when do you sleep? Ball. When do I'm, you actually? <laughs> between typically, like last night I went to bed about 3.30, uh, between 3.30 and, you know, 8, 7, 8. Yeah, I'm not a. I'm a night person, so and, and not really a morning person, but yet I don't know how to sleep in. So it's kind of a weird, <laughs> a weird thing. But I, I keep, uh, you know, that saying you sleep when you're dead. I think that really, really is me. That is me as well. So my last question, it's the million dollar question. And this is the most important question of this entire interview. Mayor, what makes the village of Fraser Lake such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? I think the sense of community here is absolutely phenomenal. Like the the people are very tight knit. They care about each other. They take care of each other. It's, you know, the senior center in town is pretty amazing. It's a gem in Fraser Lake. And we're very lucky to have that. And just the, the overall beautif beautification that we've done and been working on, it, it's making a difference. We, we have some more work to do there, but the, the beautiful lake, you know, we are a drive through community. So we're one of those communities that's right on the way to Prince Rupert. And, you know, you could stop here, you could stay here. And it, it has potential. This town has more potential than most communities because of that. But it, it's just, you know, if you like boating, and you like fishing, and you like hunting, and we're, you know, in the north, that's kind of what we do. <laughs> And I wouldn't say we're the north, by the way. I would say we're north central BC. We're right in the middle of BC, so it's not really that north yet. But still, people call call it the north. But uh, yeah, we just have a, we have a lot a lot going for us because of the lake and and the mountain that's right in town, and it's wonderful to hike. And I'm gonna put little mouse stores on it. I think we're gonna make it jazz it up a little bit and people can find little geocaches or something i don't know we, we got lots of plans lots of ideas and i think that we're gonna knock it out of the park when it comes to tourism with fraser lake well mayor i want to thank you so much for sitting down for the last 45 minutes and talking about yourself but also your community it was an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show thanks very much for having me chris so with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.